Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Nothing makes people more infuriated than the government spying on them, illegally tapping into computers, phones, and emails. Today, we will be learning the truth about how this all started straight from the leading expert. Before Edward Snowden, the original whistleblower on the NSA was Mr. William Binney. Bill was a highly placed intelligence officer who worked at the United States National Security Agency for over 30 years. He is regarded as one of the best mathematicians and code breakers in the history of the NSA. As a whistleblower, Bill exposed to the world issues concerning Dick Cheney, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama regarding the highly questionable policies of their administrations. Today, we are looking forward to an incredible show because we are welcoming Mr. William Binney. We've created an exclusive report to accompany this very special interview. Everyone can download it at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Bill. And now, it is my distinct privilege to introduce and welcome to the show, Mr. William Binney. How are you doing today, Bill? Well, pretty good, and thank you for having me. Oh, we are so thrilled and honored to have you here with us. Bill, we want to start right off the top by diving straight into your position within the NSA. When did it begin? What was your title? And what was your most important function with that agency? Well, uh, <clears throat> primarily my, my job uh, for the first 28 years I was there <clears throat> was the Soviet Union. So I was solving all kinds of codes and uh, th data systems and things of that nature there. So it was a cryptology effort. And so I had a lot of fun doing that. I mean, uh, those things are very challenging and very mind con concentrating and very, very absorbing when you start doing them. If you, <clears throat> for example, when you, when you uh, start on them, you, you can't let them at, at work. You simply walk home and they're still in your mind. They keep, really, you know, this is, how, this is how intense this stuff is. It just, absorbs everything. And so uh, after that, uh, <clears throat> I became the technical director of, the, of Russia, which was the, doing the Soviet Union, and then it expanded to the uh, Warsaw Pact and the entire uh, European uh, Asian area with Russia and the Warsaw Pact. So, uh, and then I, after that, in 1997, I became the technical director of the world, <laughs> which I like that title, technical director of the world. It was actually technical director of the World Geopolitical and Military Analysis and Reporting. That was like 6,000 analysts in NSA. They're basically the, the people who did the reporting on communications intelligence for people communicating with people. So, and it was for the whole world. <clears throat> and throughout that, the job was to figure out what were the main technical problems that had to be solved and actually design how to solve them, or at least help lead the effort to solve those problems. Uh, and uh, so in 97, I took on the entire world. And at that point, uh, it was uh, fundamentally the digital age and the explosion of digital communications in terms of cell phones and, and computers and uh, mobile systems and things of that nature. And uh, it was basically doubling the problem. So if you had like two and a half mil billion uh, uh, landline phones in the world, you know, you now had five billion landline and mobile phones. So it just doubled, and so that was the expansion of the communications problem we were facing. And so I had to design a way to figure out what was the, I mean, because our analysts were so buried by data, even back then in the 1990s, uh, they were still buried by data. They'd come in and they'd look at 40 to 50,000 items a day, and they couldn't get through them. That's why things keep getting missed, because there's too much data. And uh, so I had to figure out a way of making content uh, manageable. For the analysts. And so I, I designed a targeted approach that went in and only pulled out, for example, if you look at it or talk, talk in terms that they do, I only pulled the needles out of the haystack and anything associated with them based on, you know, human behavior, which gave you justification, probable cause. And only that was also pulled out. The rest of it simply let go right by. That was our filtering process right up front. Uh, then, in the process, also, we put behind that, uh, uh, once you were pulled in, as a, uh, known targets came directly in because they were targeted and weren't, and warrants were, were uh, available and all that. The rest of the zone, what we call the zone of suspicion, based on probable cause to look the at... The zone of, did you say the zone of suspicion? 
the zone of suspicion. I like that. <laughs> it's like uh, if you, if I communicated directly with the uh, the Yemen terrorist facility in in uh, in Yemen, like the one they called into the San Diego pair who were here for 9/11, uh, then I would be targeted, and so would everybody I then communicated with. So that's like two zones of uh, two two hops or two degrees of separation from a known terrorist area. Mm -hmm. So I would pull out the data that I sent and that the center sent. So that I'd be looking at anybody in that. So you could pick up things like front companies and things like that. Mm. You know, now, so, Bill, I want to um, mm. note here, as everyone can probably tell, Bill is highly technical. And our next question pertains to one of the very many programs yeah. that you actually created for the yeah. NSA. So I'm going to attempt to keep our conversation down to where I can understand it okay. and, then, right. and then our whole audience can because they're highly intelligent. So right. I'm sort of the base of this. You have spoken many times of the thin thread right. in terms of intelligence mm -hmm. that could have warned in advance of attacks such as 9-11. Please break down what the thin thread is for all of us. Okay, well, that's what I was basically describing was the fundamental process of thin thread. Mm -hmm. So that we pull only the needles out, and so the rest of the data would simply go by, giving everybody in the world privacy, but as well as making content now a manageable problem for the analysts. They're focusing on a limited amount of data, not the entire world, you know. So once you do, for example, if they do the way they did it was word searches. They called it dictionary select, put a phrase in or a word or a combination of things, and and then have the algorithms go through all the data and pull, and pull all the information that matched and dump it on the analysts. Well, that's why they were getting so much data. And then after 9-11, they simply, you know, the, the data they were collecting at that point after that was uh, orders of magnitude more than they had been in the 90s when they were already buried. So that only made it even more difficult because it meant the analysts had orders of magnitude more data to look at. So, and the whole idea was with ThinThread was to focus and make it a rich environment for the analysts to succeed. So you, you limit what you take in based on rules and based on human behavior that makes them, prob gives, justifies probable cause. Mm -hmm. And that, that simply was the way we did it. <clears throat> and it worked just fine. And the problem was it worked too well. That was the problem at NSA. Because they, at the same time, uh, 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 the director, Director uh, Hayden, was uh, uh, proposing a $3.8 billion program called Trailblazer, and that was his first request for the first five years of that program. Uh, and the program we did for ThinThread cost us $3.2 million. So he was asking for a program 1,000 times the cost of the ThinThread program. And so what he had to do, see, because we had solved the problem of volume, velocity, and variety, and the digital problem, basically. We had already done that. Right. So in order, to get, in order to justify the money to Congress, he had to get rid of our program. <gasps> and so that's exactly what they did. Uh, but then when 9-11 happened, they reconsidered and they said, hey, our program was the only one that could address massive amounts of data. So in other words, we were graphing everything. So we knew the relationships, social networks of everybody in the world. And so that was the way, <clears throat> that was the way they looked at it. Cheney wanted to know everything about everybody that was a, you know, that could possibly be a, a, a political issue with them or anybody opposing their, their uh, programs and the agenda so that he could basically figure out how to address it. You know, it's just like Nixon, he grew up under Nixon. So Nixon wanted, that's how, why he had Watergate. He wanted to know about his uh, uh, political opponents. So for him and for that, he got impeached. Uh, and, you know, I know uh, uh, Kucinich wanted to read articles of impeachment on George W. Bush in the end of the House, on the House floor, but it didn't go any further because Nancy Pelosi said impeaching George Bush is off the table. Now, why did she say that? Well, the reason she said that was back in October of 2001, the government, they, this is how uh, Cheney and Bush, uh, basic, basically Cheney was running it. It was called a blood oath for Cheney blood oath inside NSA. So in order to, in order to get that program running and keep it going, he had to- What was it called out. again, Bill? Say that again. What was it, it called? Uh, they changed the name from Thin Thread to Stellar Wind. 
Stellar Wind. Stellar Wind was the spying program on everybody inside the United States. All, and I figured it was about 280 million of us, roughly. Uh, because those are the numbers of people using electronic devices, phones, computers, or using credit cards or, you know, banking. And specifically, so, when did this start? About what year? Uh, it, started, <clears throat> it started in uh, October of 2001. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right after 9-11. Right after 9-11. <clears throat> Uh, but there was evidence they wanted to do it before because Joe Naccio, the head of Quest, in a court case uh, said that his lawyer said that he was approached by NSA to turn over all the material on his customers. I don't know how many million U.S. citizens that would be, but it was Quest company. And uh, they were approached in on the 27th of February of 2001, about seven months before 9-11. So well, there was intent there to spy on everybody. And I think that came from Cheney because Cheney wanted to know everything about everybody. And with the program we had developed, that gave them the capacity, and Hayden passed that on, to give them the capacity to do exactly what Cheney wanted. Right. There's two <clears throat> things I want to address really quickly in what you said. One is the financial implication. Um, <clears throat> how could Thin Thread being so fiscally responsible to the American taxpayer who's paying for all of this. Compare those numbers one more time. Thin thread cost what and the ultimate program they wanted for whatever reason. And where, would, where did that money go also? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, it was, uh, it was the uh, Trailblazer program. And so this was like the first five years uh, for a, a program to be developed by industry. Okay, he was outsourcing the problem. He, so he didn't want the solution that was inside, he wanted an outside solution. And it cost 1,000 times as much as, as the Thin Thread program doing it internally. And the reason is because we focused in on what was important and what we could prove and only pulled that data out. And the rest of it we let go by. The Trailblazer program, they wanted to do everything, okay? And so uh, what they did was they outsourced it to contractors who really didn't know how to do, uh, you know, intelligence uh, programs. They weren't. They aren't intelligence analysts. They didn't. Uh, they didn't know how to do it, and so it failed in 2006. Five years later, <laughs> and then after that, Alexander. After how much money was spent, Bill? Uh, roughly, uh, I think uh, Tom Drake said when he left, it was about double or triple the original cost. So we're talking, uh, you know, ten to twelve billion. 10 to 12 billion dollars, okay. But it didn't stop there. Okay, Alexander came in. You know, after the failed program, uh, the SISI, uh, the intelligence, Senate Intelligence Committee, removed decision-making authority from NSA and gave it to DOD uh, contracting because they said NSA could not manage programs that costing more than $100 million a year. So they transferred that authority to uh, to uh, DOD contracting. And when, so when Alexander came in and replaced Hayden at, at uh, NSA, he changed the name of the program from Trailblazer to Turbulence. And so he created another one. He wanted to spend about a half a billion a year. And in order to do that and avoid the decision-making authority at the DOD, he broke the Trailblazer or Turbulence program into nine separate programs, each costing less than 100 million. So now he managed the whole thing internally in NSA, but he did it in parts. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's how do you avoid uh, the legislation from Congress? This is the kind of thing they do. Okay? Mm. So it's the legislation from Congress, really, that, I mean, eats up all of our money and then it's gone huge amounts when in reality it shouldn't cost that much. Everyone knows this, but this is the first time I'm speaking of someone that knows exactly what happens, yeah. knows the number. Bill, I want to shift now into the topic of eavesdropping and illegal surveillance. Yeah. Yeah. What was the scenario that led to your actions as a whistleblower and what was the specific situation that evolved? What really happened behind the scenes at the NSA that led to all of us being spied on? Uh, <clears throat> well, it, it was done again by Hayden and Tennant getting together. So it was really Bush, Cheney, Hayden, and Tennant at the core of this. They were the ones who made the decision to go ahead and do all this stuff. So uh, in uh, that, that decision, I think, was made in early September of 2001. 
Uh, and then by, uh, by late September, all the equipment was starting to come in for the program. They wanted to develop the spy on everyone. And then they moved it down the hall from us in NSA. Uh, and uh, they had, uh, our people had to set it up because we were the only ones who knew how the, how the code worked, how to set up the uh, software and the hardware and to get it to running. So once they did that, and by, by the second week in, uh, in October, they had it all set up and running, and the first input was all of the data from AT&T on U.S. communications. That meant <clears throat> roughly 340 million U.S. calls to U.S. people, between U.S. people, uh, every day. That was long distance calling. Uh, and then <clears throat> later other companies came in, Verizon, uh, and, and the program for uh, AT&T became a separate one and named it uh, Fairview. Now, the Fairview program has almost 100 taps on the fiber lines inside the United States, and they put devices to sessionize everything on those lines and pull it into NSA. So they were copying everything we were doing on the fiber lines. And, so, and when Verizon joined, that was just more taps and more fiber lines. And then other companies, roughly about 30 of them for telecommunications, phones, and, and uh, email came in. Ultimately, I believe, based on the uh, Verizon uh, general warrant issued by the FISA court uh, in, uh, that was exposed by Edward Snowden as the first thing from the Snowden material, there are roughly 78 companies involved in, the, in this program of data being transferred to NSA from these companies. That was in 2013. So in 2013, you're telling us that Verizon, AT&T, among 78 other companies, were all feeding all of our information, all of our calls, everything, taped into the NSA? Well, it wasn't taped. What they did was they set up separate rooms like Mark Klein exposed in the AT&T Center in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. where they put up a separate room where they had sessionizers in the room and they, they routed all of the fiber into that room. And then that sessionized put it, reconstructed all the communications and electronically forwarded that to NSA. And that was done at over almost 100 tapping points by AT&T inside the United States. And it's distributed with the population. Um, if, if your uh, listeners want to go to Google and use uh, NSA Space Fairview, they can read all about it. It's all on the web from, from Edward Snowden. And, okay. it shows, and it shows the tapping points. <clears throat> and those tapping points, uh, I have the location of every building there. So, uh, and I got that <clears throat> from a 1960s, uh, 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 basically a, an outline of the microwave network for AT&T, then called Bell, Bell Communications. Mm -hmm. And that basically lays right over top of all the tapping points for the Fairview program. So, so they so, weren't recording us. They were tapping in and actually listening to us. Uh, well, the listening came later. What they would do is store it. And I've got the evidence now that they're, they're using a translation devices to go with the phones and just doing an, a translation that's roughly 80% correct. And then I believe they're using algorithms to go through it to kind of score it based on words or phrases use it, used. And then that means uh, that once the scoring reaches a certain threshold, they pump it to or prioritize it for places like Sport Gordon, Georgia's, where, where they have about 2,000 translators, and they listen to it and translate it to uh, text. Oh, I see. So Otherwise, they, otherwise right, it's so. all text trans by, translated by a uh, translation device like uh, Dragon or something of that nature. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to understand, you know, were they listening in? Were they taping our phone calls? What exactly was the impact for myself and everybody mm -hmm. listening? Uh, they have, if, they, if you become a target, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the implication is they will retroactively analyze every phone call, every email, every financial transaction, everything electronic that you've ever done. And like, for example, in the case of uh, Elliot Spitzer, when he was going after the bankers for defrauding people in the 2007-2008 uh, uh, financial crisis, he was actually going to criminally prosecute them uh, because of an obvious fraud. Uh, you know, the passing and, and uh, ever-increasing uh, uh, costing of the uh, mortgage packages that they were passing around the world. 
that was a fraud, and they advertised it uh, fraudulently, and he was going after them for criminal prosecution. So <clears throat> they had to get rid of, they had to protect their bankers, so they've got to get rid of Elliot Spitzer. So what was the probable cause for Elliot Spitzer being investigated? There wasn't any, okay, except that he's going after our bankers. And so they went into the data and found some exchange with him with the prostitute, and they used that against him. So, uh, and if you have all the data about somebody, this is the kind of thing you can do. And now this, the, uh, the secret government, the, in, you know, the military intelligence com complex, all of the deep state can now protect itself because they have all this data from anyone trying to expose what they're doing. That answers the question of why. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah this is why. Because you power over everybody not just here in the United States, but all around the world, everybody. It also That's makes incredible. you wonder what, why certain judges in the federal court system are doing and making decisions that they do, especially when they're questionable according to law. Because they're being blackmailed by something they've done maybe 15 years ago that they can retroactively go back and pick up on. Or more, yes, more than that, too, because the spying went even before that, but it was selective spying back then on <clears throat> people in the court system, federal judges, you know, the Supreme Court, members of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Congress, and the White House, right? Right. This is yes. the intelligence complex. I call them the Praetorian Guard. You can see they tried an attempted coup on President Trump. So, <clears throat> yeah. This, Speak this, to this. this. Speak to yeah, this. this. What's this. happening here, Bill? Oh, well, they've been discredited on everything. The Mueller report is a piece of junk, you know, a bunch of uh, allegations unsupported by anybody except that they wish they could get rid of President Trump. So let's make something up. Uh, and we forensically proved that everything they were talking about in the Russiagate uh, hack into the DNC was false and a lie. Uh, it was downloaded to a thumb drive or a, uh, uh, a CD-ROM and transported before WikiLeaks even had it. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the point is, no so wait, wait. So stop, Bill. You have proof yes. that it was not a Russian hack into the Absolutely. DNC. Yep. There was no Russian hoax. You have proof no. it was actually downloaded. Yes. Yeah, and it's, just, it's directly from the DNC posted d uh, data by WikiLeaks. <laughs> if you looked at the WikiLeaks data, uh, you, we would find out that the, there's 35,816 emails there. And if you looked at them all, they all had a uh, last modified time stamp rounded to the, all, all in even seconds. Now, what that means is that that's a property of the file allocation table format where you read a software that reads something to a storage device like a thumb drive or a CD-ROM. Uh, and that proves that that data was downloaded and then physically transported before WikiLeaks posted it. Now that says it was no hack. Wow. And that's, and that's absolute proof of it. The government's trying to avoid discussing this, by the way, publicly. You notice that nobody's ever said anything about forensic material in the investigations by the House or Senate or Mueller. I mean, I was never in, I requested, the only person who said they wanted to hear what I had to say was the president. And he told uh, the then director of CIA, Pompeo, that if he wanted to know something factual about the Russiagate, he needed to talk to me. And so I did. I went in to talk to him on the 24th of October of 2017. President Trump. Him, and uh, what was that conversation like with the well, president? It was, well, it wasn't with President Trump. It was uh, with the CIA Director Pompeo. Okay. He opened up by saying uh, the president told him if he wanted to learn facts about Russiagate, he needed to talk to me. So he invited me in for a discussion, and I had a one-hour talk with him on the seventh floor of CIA. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, he had two, two uh, technical people there. And they, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how technical they were, but they were asking very simple questions like, how do you know this? I said, well, it, these speed transfers are very simple. Just go on the web and all this evidence is out there. It's been posted. You can go and look at the Goose for Two data, for example, and see that you'll have a file name and an amount of characters. And then at the end of the file, a timestamp. And it's file after file that way. So timestamp, file, timestamp, file, timestamp. And you can take the difference between the times uh, between any one item and calculate the transfer rate for that item. That's what we did. 
but these people didn't seem to understand how to do that. <laughs> it means they didn't even look at the data in my mind. Okay. So when I did that, you know, and I uh, did it with Duncan Campbell in the UK, we came up with the highest transfer speed was 49.1 megabytes per second. Then a byte is a character. So that's eight bits. So that means you have, you know, 49.1 million characters per second. <laughs> and, and we said that can't go across the web. That's just too fast. Uh, and uh, we, and eventually we said, people opposed that said, yes, it can. So I said, we, okay, we're going to physically test it. And we did. I had some hackers in Europe uh, who are moving around. Uh, and also people here, a guy here in the, in the U.S. who would put out a, you know, a megabyte of or a gigabyte of data and say, here, transfer it. And I had these people try to transfer it from, from uh, Albania, uh, Serbia, and uh, in Belgrade, and uh, Netherlands, and Amsterdam, several places. And then in the U.K., back to London, between data center in New Jersey and, and the data center in London. Well, we couldn't come anywhere near that. I mean, the vast, fastest we got was 12 megabytes, less than one-fourth the transfer rate of the, the highest speed uh, between two data centers. Now, that was a data center transfer, not the average person in the web or not the average hacker. He didn't have access to those high speed lines. So, you know, so what that to us was, you know, the proof, and we posted all that with consortium news and, and, uh, various, and, and through the VIPs, the Veteran Intelligent Professionals for Sanity. So we were trying to add factual information here. And... <laughs> Nobody has disputed that. Some people said, well, we can still get it across. I said, okay, well, why don't you tell me where you can get it across and we'll help you do it. And since then, I haven't heard anything from anybody, not even the NSA and the CIA or FBI. That is incredible. So the person known as the best code breaker in the history of the NSA was called in, mm -hmm. sat down, actually tested this whole thing proved what could be done and what couldn't be done and That's came right. to your conclusion and nothing. Well, it's more important than that too. Yeah. With the Gooseberg 2 data, again, looking at the data he posted, he posted 5 July and 1 September, two sets of data. But if you looked at those and only paid attention to minutes, seconds, and milliseconds, those two files would merge like a deck of cards being shuffled. Now, the probability of that being possible is almost infinitesimal. That means that Gooseberg 2 had made one download of data, split it into two files, and just to make a claim that he had two, two hacks into the DNC, right? And claimed it was his hack from the DNC, but that merger says he's playing with the data, and he's playing with us, and he's a total fake. Now, who is Goose for 2? Yeah, Goose for 2. That's one of the things that Rosenstein and Mueller use as a basis for their allegation that the Russians, they were representatives mm -hmm. of the Russians and that the Russians were still hacking in. And that was one of, that was their basis for the indictment, the DC leaks and Gooseberg 2. Well, we didn't have any data on DC, two, DC leaks, but we did for Gooseberg 2. And we proved he was a fake. Also, the time stamping was suggesting that all the material that was being uh, uh, put together by Gooseberg 2 was being done on the east coast of the United States. Also, uh, we had something in central time and one in the Pacific time. But in any case, all of that suggested the activity of Gooser 2 was inside the United States, not in Russia. And so just the fact that he's a fake inside the United States somewhere said that this whole, this whole business of Gooser 2 is a fabrication. And Rosenstein and Mueller used that as a basis for what they said in their reports and also their indictment of those 12 Russians. Wow. I mean, these people are fake. Our people, fake. Rosenstein and Mueller, are faking this. They're right? faking they're this. It, yes, and they're basing it on false information that they know is false because they know our forensic evidence and they've said absolutely nothing because it discredits everything they've been claiming. That's incredible coming from... Uh, one of the highest intelligence officers from the NSA. Um, I'm also, I would add this. Yes. I'm also ashamed, and this is what I told Director uh, uh, Pompeo. I said, all these intelligence agencies are lying to you. It's a shame. I'm, a, I'm ashamed of my intelligence uh, agency, the NSA, for not speaking up because they know this data too. I mean, it's not, it's not that hard to, to, to see this, and they could go do that too. And the fact that they haven't spoken up tells them they're all, all are all a part of it. 
You know, they're, they're all part of this attempted soft coup of, of President Trump. Now, this is treason. People are lying to them. Bill, this falls under treason when you yes, attempt a coup yeah. on a sitting president, right? That's, that's the way I look at it. At a, at a minimum, it's sedition. Now, um, I think you answered this question, but you used the term before, subverted. Were you referring to the fact that they've kept all this information on everyone so that somebody pops up and turns out to be a problem, they can retroactively go back and take care of them? Is that what that refers to? Yes, plus the fact that it's uh, denying, uh, for example, uh, they'll use the, uh, this is the other thing that uh, Senator uh, Feinstein talked about, the value of this program when it was, when it was being challenged back in 2013, they were trying to unfund it. The uh, Amos Conyers coalition in the House were trying to put together a bill to unfund the NSA uh, collection, bulk collection. Um, and Rosenstein came out, I mean, uh, Feinstein came out and uh, said on the Senate floor that this is such a ba valuable program that we put hundreds of people in jail every year with it. Now, what they do is this. They take the NSA data, find criminal activity, because they're copying everything they can look at anybody they want. So if they get a tip from the street, they can look, go look and see what that person's doing. Everything. So once they see that, they pass that to state and local police to go do the arrests of those people. But they don't give them the data from NSA to back it up to take to court. Why? Because it was acquired without a warrant in violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And then uh, also the first, because it tells you the associates, so you know, no, no longer have free association. Okay, so you're violating these two, those two. But when they take it to court, they, they have to do what's called a parallel construction. And this was DOJ policy. The policy is to say, okay, we, know, we use this data to arrest these people, but we can't present the NSA data in a court of law because it, it wasn't acquired with a warrant. So what we do is a parallel construction. We send our police people out to look to see where the, you can get the data the, using standard policing techniques. It helps that you know where it is from NSA, makes it easier. Uh, and then we substitute that data in the court of law to prosecute. That's called perjury. That's also fabrication of evidence in a court of law. And they've been doing this. And, and one of the federal agents in the report from Reuters about this program back in 2013 said, you know, this is such a great program, I just hope we can keep it secret. Now, this is a total destruction of our judicial process. And it threatens every person in our country, in the world. Including all the judges, all the, all the members of parliaments around the world, our Congress, everybody. Yes. Everyone. Yep. So that's why they have power over Congress people. And that's why Congress people do things that are odd once they get there. And this, this is the one thing they want to maintain. This is the super secret they don't want to address in public. That's why they're fighting all of these, uh, all of these suits that, that have been coming forth, like the EFF lawsuit. Uh, and, uh, 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 I can't remember the name of it, but it, it, it was uh, EFF is doing that lawsuit. I'm doing one with a, another lawyer, Elliot Schuchart, in the Third Circuit, and the EFF one. Uh, is in uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, and there's uh, uh, another one coming in with the uh, with the Roger Stone case because that's an opportunity also to begin to address this kind of bulk acquisition, uh, meaning that the NSA has the trace routes of programs of any data being being passed around the web. They've got hundreds and hundreds of trace route programs that do actually hundreds of millions of trace routes every day. And so they know the packets and all they have to do is have one packet traced from the DNC and they'll know if it was a hack, where it went. Well, that's why I said from the very beginning, obviously this is not a, a, a true because NSA isn't saying we, it went exactly to this building in, in the Moscow or anywhere in the, Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union. So, I mean, you know, that, that told me right away that this was a farce. So I've, had, I've suggested to the lawyers in the Roger Stone case that they do a FOIA, a, a discovery, basically, in court of all the trace route programs for the DNC pro, uh, emails because the government was still asserting that it was hacked. So if they've got a hack, they've got trace routes. So that's one of the things I was saying they should be doing. Uh, and that would expose the extent of the penetration of the communications network inside the United States of N by NSA. 
Uh, and CIA and FBI, by the way, have direct access to this database with no oversight whatsoever. That's how they could do all these prosecutions and everything that, of U.S. citizens. It's a total violation of the Fifth Amendment because they're using that data to testify against themselves, which they didn't, should, weren't allowed to, to have to begin with. And it's a violation then of the Sixth Amendment because they don't get due process. They can't really face the, the data that was or the evidence that was used against them in a, in a criminal court because it's not the real true evidence. They so have actually no idea where the evidence came from. If they, yes. you know, they caught you doing That's so, found you, and then they go to prove it in another route. Wow. On and everyone. This is, a, this is a total subversion of the Constitution. They're just subverting it. We say we're doing this, but it's a lie. That is incredible. Speaking of faking it, um, you talked about Rosenstein and Mueller. What do you make of Mueller's testimony? He's a part of the uh, uh, cabal to try to uh, uh, basically give a soft coup against Trump. He's been a part of that from the beginning. That's why he's been saying certain things that allow it to continue to argue that the Democrats there together with him on this. So it's a matter of them, uh, them uh, basically creating the scenario that keeps this false narrative going. He's directly involved. He's been involved from the, uh, with the Stellar Wind program, the domestic spying program from 2001 on. He said this in an interview to, with Bart Gellman in 2011 when he thought he was leaving as head of the FBI. He said, well, we've been using the Stellar Wind program, the domestic spying program, since 2001. And they've been using this uh, Stellar Wind, this uh, parallel construction as a way and a means of, of convict, convicting people inside the United States of crime. Wow. And the DEA is involved with it. They have direct access, and that includes members of the IRS. They're looking at it, too. That's how they could get to know who was involved with the Tea Party, how they could see how they then could slow roll them as getting, you know, for 501c3 when they, when they would ap apply for that. That's how they'd slow roll them. That's how they'd slow roll all the religious organizations because they already know the social network of the people involved. So you know everybody that's connected with the Tea Party or any religious group that's trying to get politically active, you know all the relationships. So that gives you the idea of who to target by limit, slow rolling or who to slow roll with the IRS. That's what the IRS has been doing. This is so terrifying because um, when you come out with the truth, um, you, you know, they have, um, we've been speaking very highly, everyone is about, you know, these four congresswomen that were talking about how our detainment centers are concentration camps and just ridiculous allegations. But yeah. when anyone comes up with the truth up against them and seems to get some wind behind them about let's go prove this wrong, they kind of disappear then. It's a mystery. Yeah. It's, yeah, this, this explains a whole lot. So what happens is basically someone approaches them with what they have. Yeah. Or, or somebody they care about and they use them if there's something with somebody they care about, they use that against them, too, as leverage to say, stop what you're doing. Oh, my gosh. Because, again, they, they know where their entire relationships, everything, everybody they're involved with. All their friends, coworkers, everything. And their family members and how they're related. So that's the way you do it. That's the way the KGB did it. That's the way the Gestapo did it. A standard uh, totalitarian processing and 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 spying on everybody has been a main objective of uh, totalitarian dictator type uh, states all along back through history all the way back to Caesar Augustus you know and it probably even goes in before that except that we don't have the records but the, I'm sure you know the uh, the Egyptians wanted to know everything their population was thinking so they could take care of it you know. And they didn't have the technology, though, right. that we have today, which is so invasive. I would, can I add right here that, yes. uh, for example, uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, a former East German Stasi lieutenant colonel, said a quote, and we quoted him in the newspapers, about the NSA uh, spying program. He said, uh, for us, meaning the Stasi, this would have been a, d a dream come true because they were doing everything in paper. You know, they had rows and rows and files and files of cabinets with nothing but uh, folders on individuals inside the e East Germany. And they Much were doing- slower, all, right? Yeah, and the, and, the, and the KGB and MVD were doing similar kinds of things. So 
Um, but for, for now, and now it looks to me like the Russians have created a similar program in their country trying to emulate what we're doing. And so are the Chinese. So we're leading the way for totalitarian states on how to, how to manage their populations. That's what we're doing. And worse than that, we're spreading it to all the democracies in the world. I call this the metastasizing malignancy being spread around the world. We're destroying democracy wherever it exists in the world because everybody's emulating with what, what we're doing. Uh, for example, in the, in the NSA database, uh, they've got the five eyes input, all the English speaking countries, Canada, US, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, and they have like nine other countries like Japan, uh, Poland, uh, Germany, you know, uh, Netherlands, uh, uh, probably France and Sweden and places like that, inputting data to the same database. And then they use an, they become an NSA is now they basically the storage facility for all the information on everybody. So what happens is the five eyes have a greater access to it than the rest of the countries. So they, they correlate with a program called IC reach. Uh, your, your viewers or listeners can also get to this by Googling NSA space program IC Reach, and they'll get to read all about it. And the same is true with the X Key Score program, which the other countries use, also the embassies around the world use that to query that database to get information on people. So it's destroying, uh, and, and the, all, all this, put, the FBI and the DEA and all their relationships are being fed the results of this information, but not given it to, so it's really subverting their judicial process too. It, because it's giving secret information collected illegally for them to go arrest their people and then they have to do a parallel construction over there, you know? So <laughs> it's totally destroying the judicial process, not just of the, of the US, but of all democracies in the world. That's incredible because they can literally make anybody do anything, a judge, a congressperson. Yeah, one of the things they do is they look for uh, uh, princes or uh, people in the uh, Middle Eastern countries going on the web looking at pornography because they do that. That's a no-no in their countries, and that's direct leverage against them. So, wow. You know, this and goes... And similar things they go through and look at any, any way of getting leverage on anybody, they do that. So... Bill, this goes so much deeper than Epstein because we've we've been under the impression that the little black book from Epstein is going to show you know everything that everybody needs to see, but in reality, they already know all of this on everybody anyway. Well, but they're not taking advantage of it, you see, because there's so much data that they have to look at. But I, I sent in a, a note with uh, Robert Steele uh, uh, to the to the president saying uh, all the business, all the knowledge of. Uh, of where the pedophile, pedophiles are in the world is re resident in the NSA databases and we know how to get it out. So that if you, if, you, if you want to know the entire pedophile work network for the world, you can easily get it. Fantastic. Bill, what do you think of President Trump? Uh, I think he's the only hope for us to, to stop this spying and to stop this violation and destruction of our constitutional rights. You did. I mean, no one else is standing up to do that. He's our, basically our only hope. I mean, the rest of them are, there's so much money involved in this. There's over $100 billion a year spent in the IC, of which a significant part of that goes to this, this kind of program. Um, uh, CIA has also separate programs that they do similar to this. Um, one of them uh, we've been talking about is, uh, is being discussed now uh, by some people, and hopefully they'll take action on it. Uh, so uh, the idea is that this needs to be stopped and there are ways and means of being able to get to terrorists or bad people without violating the constitutional rights of everybody and without violating human rights around the world. I mean, and we, we have, and, and the point is that Hayden and company knew that from the very beginning, but I called and I'm basically what I've said is that he and others, you know, Bush, Cheney, Hayden and Tennant were the core but they had legal teams supporting them too, like uh, 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 Ryu out of the OLC and Gonzalez as the president things. And uh, <coughs> I can't remember Hayden or uh, Cheney's uh, guy, but he's, they were also all part of this, trying to legally justify it in secret where nobody could see it, you know? And uh, to me, this, uh, this whole thing could be done 
very directly for a very much and the point was that it was like one thousandth the cost and that was the real driver too because Hayden could build an empire uh, Cheney could get all the data he wanted on everybody so he satisfied his objective and then also satisfied Hayden to become a bigger bureaucrat get a bigger budget all of this um, and also it gives power to this intelligence complex uh, against everybody in the world so you know it just uh, it just was a total corruption of everything we thought we were as a country exactly it takes all of our money and all of our privacy at the same time puts all of the intelligence in the hands of people that will use it against you that's while right. they're keeping you poor <laughs> That's right. Also, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, quite a number of years ago, Goethe said, uh, uh, no one is more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they're free. That is us. This is so mind blowing. I know that all of our viewers are just sitting back gasping at this point in time, just like myself. Well, um, sure. It's very enlightening. Um, Bill, this has been beyond an amazing interview, and it's such an honor to have you on this show. Before we go, knowing what you know and what you've personally witnessed, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience and all Americans at this point in history? Uh, well, yes. I would, I would say that they hope with the president, the current President Trump that we have, uh, and, and his work and uh, co coordination with the Attorney General Barr to ensure that the law is followed. And if, they, <clears throat> if he starts issuing referrals for indictments to a grand jury uh, for the people who have been committing these crimes, then this is a way to start. We have to start putting those people in jail. Otherwise, if you don't, if you don't put them in jail, then they'll do it again. So, I mean, the point is you have to hold people accountable and they haven't been doing that up until Barr and President Trump are in office. So now it looks like we may get accountability. If we do, there are ways to correct this whole problem very quickly or reasonably quickly, not just for us, but for the entire world. We can go in and make sure that like the program that, that we designed for ThinThread would go through the entire database, pull everything out that's relevant, and then and then just um, erase everything else. That would correct the entire database. Now, no one would have that database to be used against anybody. Okay, so, so I mean, uh, you, you could do that uh, reasonably quickly uh, and, and basically destroy all of the violations that these people have been doing of our rights. Beautiful. And, and make it impossible for them to do it because the data would not be there. So if you don't have the data, you can't abuse it. So the key now is whether or not Attorney General Barr starts making referrals to a grand jury for indictments. If he starts doing that, you know we're on the right track. If he doesn't, you know we're, he's a part now of the deep state and for one reason or the other doesn't want to correct the problem. Hmm. Man, we're going to be watching him like a hawk because <laughs> if he starts to change, we know that somebody's got something on him or someone he loves. You know what I mean? I mean, yep. it'll become yep, evident. Right to everyone. Um, one more question before we go. Since this was started essentially under George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, how can they be held accountable and what would happen to them if the um, if Barr goes after them? Uh, well, I'm not sure about the, how the law would work. I think in most cases the statute of limitations has been has passed. I don't know about the statute of limitations if he wants to go after them for treason. You know, if you, I don't know what the statute of limitations there is. So, <clears throat> I mean, he'd have to be, he'd have to find something in the law that would allow him to charge them with a criminal act uh, and, uh, and they can conform with what statutes of limitations are existing, you know. And one more quick question. What about Hillary Clinton? Uh, I mean, it's obvious that she should be prosecuted. I mean, <clears throat> she, she exposed so many SAP programs, special access programs, in her, in her, private email system, plus that, plus any number of, I mean, she basically took uh, what's called gamma material was one of them. That's a decrypt. That means we are decrypting that encryption system. She took a virtual, uh, a, a basic statement right out of a gamma report and, and put it in an email, had her people put it in an email to her on her server. So 
the implication from that is that now somebody looking at that will be able to see, ah, I go look at the guy and see what systems he's using. That's the system they're reading. So that system now is readable anywhere in the world. So that means that alerts everybody in the world using that system to the fact that that's not secure. <laughs> and so that's the devastating impact of just that one SAP. Now, there were, uh, uh, I think, 40 SAPs or something like that that were exposed in her, in her email. But this, is, this was such a violation. I mean, there was a young fellow on a nuclear submarine who took a, took a picture of where he worked, had it on his phone and, and had it on his uh, wife's phone, I think. Here's where I work and showed his kids. And for that, he got 30 months in jail. Now, the impact of that is nowhere near what Hillary did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the obviousness of actually taking a hammer, a physical hammer to the devices. I mean, obviously, you're doing something yeah. wrong. Yeah. After she'd been subpoenaed, after yeah. those records were subpoenaed. Yeah. And, it's, you know. Um, it's multiple crimes, destruction of evidence, obstruction of justice, all of that, you know. It's just outrageous. Well, you have been, this has been such an enlightening show. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. No, thank you for allowing me to say all this so that it gets out. Yeah, we would love to have you back to do a follow-up. Sure. That's fine. Perfect. Wonderful. Mr. William Binney, former NSA intelligence officer, American patriot, and whistleblower, whose incredible insights are covered in our exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Bill for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.